you first get involved in hammock camping, you might be presented with a cacophony of information about tarps, about suspension systems, about insulation, the list goes on and on. And in the midst of all that, you might hear something about the hang angle, which is the angle of the cord or the webbing that goes from the corner of the hammock to the tree relative to the horizontal. And you'll read recommendations that that be about 30 degrees and possibly read dire warnings that if it's a lot less than 30 degrees, then you might be inducing undue force, undue stress on your suspension. Now, if you're clever, you'd say, right, 30 degrees, making a note, and perhaps even remember the little trick that says if you form a pistol with your hand, then the line from the tip of your finger to the thumb relative to the forefinger, that's about 30 degrees, and then you can eyeball your suspension to see how close you are to 30 degrees. But if you're curious, keep watching this, uh, this video because what I intend to do is to show graphically and intuitively uh, why it is that this curious relationship between an angle and force um, exists. Gravity wants to bring you crashing to the ground like Newton's apple. The trees to which the hammock suspension is attached are resisting that. We're going to describe the tension between these using something called force. Force has a direction and a magnitude or a strength. The direction of gravity is down. The force of gravity is proportional to the mass or amount of stuff of the object to which gravity is being applied. An object may be affected by multiple forces simultaneously. Going back to the apple, we have gravity that's pulling down on it, but we have also the, uh, the force of the branch to which the apple is attached pulling up on it. And in fact, they exactly cancel. The pull of the gravity is down, the pull of the branch, like a spring, is up, and the strength of the pull up is equal to the strength of the gravity pull down. They exactly cancel. So now let's apply this to hammocks and hammockers. So represent a hammock and a hammocker as a ball suspended between two trees along a suspension cord, and we've got gravity that's pulling down on them. Clearly, there's something that's countering that, some forces that are pulling up, but you can see that it's not pulling straight up. Now, to get a handle on all this, we're gonna use this notion of a vector. Graphically, a vector is an arrow, and it has a direction, and it has a length. And to talk about forces, then we're gonna represent a force with a vector, and we're gonna talk about something that's called vector addition. Now, before we talk about vector addition, we need to remember that position of the vector is not something that's an inherent uh, attribute of the vector. You can uh, take a vector and move it around in the domain all over the place. And this is gonna be key when we talk about adding two vectors, because the way that we can add them graphically is we plunk one down, and then we take the base of the second one and put it at the arrowhead of the first one and look to see where the arrowhead of the second one is after that transposition. And there'll be a line that goes from the base of the first vector to the arrowhead of the second. And that's gonna itself define a vector. And that vector is the sum of the two. Now notice that it doesn't matter which order we do that in. If we had walked the, uh, the second vector first and the first vector second, we would have come up with something that has exactly the same direction and the same magnitude. And getting fancy, we'll say that vector addition is commutative. You can do uh, addition in, in any order. Now we can add even more vectors applying the same placement procedure. Put its base at the arrowhead of where you last stopped. And the result is the vector from the origin to the head of the vector that you just most recently placed. Vector addition is also associative, which means when adding more than two vectors, the order in which you do the addition doesn't matter. And as a final point about vector addition, if after you add a bunch of vectors, you end up with the arrowhead of the result being at exactly the base of the first vector you started with, you've made a circuit, then we'll say that that sum is equal to zero. And that makes sense when you look at the result. It's the, the length of it is zero and has, has no direction at all. So now think about an object that's subject to multiple forces simultaneously. So take an airplane, for example. It has force that's pushing it forward, the thrusts of the engine. Um, it has force that's trying to keep it to the ground, which is gravity. It has force that's trying to lift it up, which is the lift on the wings. You can describe each of those forces by a vector and add all those vectors up, and the result will tell you something about uh, the behavior of the airplane. 
Now in the general case, if you take an object subject to multiple forces, describe those forces as vector, and all add them all up and get zero, what that says is that the forces cancel. Now it's tempting to say that if the forces cancel, the object is not in motion, but that's not rigorously true because we are all in motion as we spin around the Earth's axis and the Earth itself spins around the Sun. So it's really not a matter of motion, it's a matter of change of motion, it's called acceleration. So when the force is canceled, we say that the object is not accelerating. It's a technicality, but for those of you that remember your high school physics and would call me out on it if I didn't get it right, um, it's an important technicality. But an application is that if you have an object and it's subject to multiple forces, and that object is not accelerating, then that necessarily means that the sum of all those forces add to zero. And it turns out that that's exactly the insight that we need to describe why it is that a flatter hang angle induces more uh, stress, more force on the suspension. Let's go back now to the model with the suspended ball. The forces that are countering gravity obviously have to be going up and along the suspension lines. Now if the ball is centered, that means that the angle of the suspension lines to the horizontal of those two cords um, in magnitude are equal and that the lengths of the vectors, the force vectors along those suspensions um, are equal as well. So the question then becomes is, you think about the force vectors along the suspension lines and the force vector of gravity, what should the lengths of the force vectors along the suspension lines be so that when you add all these three vectors up, you get zero? Now remember that the order in which we add vectors doesn't matter. So we can add the two suspension vectors together first, and because of their geometry, their sum will always be a vector that's pointing straight up. And it's also clear that the length of the vector that's pointing straight up is going to depend on the lengths of uh, the suspension vectors. And there it is, if you unpack it, it says, look, if you tell me what the gravity force is, that's going to be the magnitude of the vector going down, and you tell me what the hang angle is, then I can tell you that there is a length of the suspension vector such that when you add those two suspension vectors, the sum will give you a vector that's pointing straight up, countering gravity, with exactly the same length as the vector that's describing gravity pointing down so that they cancel. So now it's easy to see graphically why it is that decreasing the hang angle increases the force that's on the suspension. We know that the sum of the two suspension vectors has got to be the same, whatever the hang angle is. And we can see that as we decrease the hang angle, we're going to have to increase the length of those force vectors on the suspension, which exactly proves the point. Quoad erat demonstratum. So why is 30 degrees a magic number? And just how bad would it be if the hang angle were 20 degrees or even 15 degrees? We get at this by answering the question, what is the force on the suspension for a given hang angle? And to get at this, we'll use a branch of mathematics that's called trigonometry. Trigonometry has definitions and results about right triangles and the angles and lengths of the sides of the right triangle. You remember the right triangle is one where one of the angles is 90 degrees, which means that the other two degrees are necessarily no greater than 90 degrees, and they're called acute angles. So if you pick one of the acute angles in a right triangle and compare the length of the side of the triangle that's opposite that angle and divide that by the length of the long edge or the hypotenuse, that's a definition that's called the sine of that angle. And it turns out that if you have two right triangles where the angles are the same, but one's very small and one's very large, then that ratio is the same for both of these. It means that the sine of the angle is independent of the size of the triangles, which means that you can take a calculator and punch in and find out what is the sine of 30 degrees, what is the sine of 25 degrees, and so on. Apply this now to the picture of the sum of the two suspension vectors. We have two right triangles, and the quantity of interest is the long edge, the hypotenuse of those right triangles. From this diagram, we see that the sine of the hang angle is the ratio of half of the uh, body weight divided by the thing we're interested in, which is the uh, magnitude of the force that's on the suspension vector. And so when you plug in the value of sine of 30, it turns out that the force on the suspension vector is exactly the weight 
And so that's magic. If you can remember your weight, then you can know that with a hang angle of 30 degrees, the suspension tension is, is exactly your weight. If you decrease that angle to 25 degrees, you use the same method. You just plug in the numbers for sine 25 and you come up with a value that's 118% of your weight. You use 20 degrees, it's 146% of your weight. If you use 14.5 degrees, then it's twice your weight. How much of this actually matters? Well, if you buy commercially, probably not. Commercial outfits are aware of this kind of thing and they're gonna use materials that are strong enough, so you needn't be very concerned. Um, if you're doing a do-it-yourself rig, however, it's possible to buy suspension lines that are very light and thin, have working loads that are measured in a few hundreds of pounds rather than closer to a thousand pounds. Uh, it's possible that you're heavy. It's possible that you use a structural ridge line. It's possible that you can tighten things up because you think that's cool or because you think that'll give you a better hang. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, you can push the envelope uh, in those kinds of contexts. Um, it, early in my hammocking days, um, I snapped a, a thousand pound test line, uh, probably more use of knots than uh, shallow hang angles, but the point is that it's, it's certainly possible uh, to do. Uh, the main point of the uh, video was to uh, offer some explanation for this curious relationship between the hang angle and the force on the suspension to give you some idea of why it is that you have forces on the suspension and so that when you go out and you have your next hammock nap, you can be thinking about these uh, vector additions and go right to sleep.